What does your license plate say about you? Hi, and welcome to Volusia Magazine. I'm Amber Patterson. Today, we'll bring you information on some of the newest specialty license plates available. And the sky's the limit at Daytona Beach International Airport as the demand for commercial air service continues to climb. We'll get some water safety tips from health reporter Stephanie Strong of the Volusia County Health Department, and then we'll check in about the Artificial Reef Program when Community Information Director Dave Byron sits down with his guest, Coastal Division Director Joe Nolan. Those stories, news, and more coming right up on Volusia Magazine. Stay tuned. Recycling makes a huge environmental difference because less garbage winds up in the landfill. Volusia County has one of the most successful recycling programs in the state, according to Regina Montgomery of Volusia County's Solid Waste Division. We're recycling more than 42% of the waste generated by homeowners and businesses within Volusia County. Um, in 2010, the state set a recycling goal to reach 75% by the year 2020. In Volusia County, residents have found that it's easy being green, but many are still throwing away items that belong in the recycling bin. Here's a refresher course on recycling. Most types of paper can be recycled, including newspapers, office paper, paper grocery bags, junk mail, magazines, and phone books. Cereal and pizza boxes are recyclable as long as the liners are removed. Empty detergent boxes and beverage cartons can be recycled, and don't toss your cardboard boxes. Just break them down to four feet by four feet and place them next to your recycling bin. Glass bottles of all colors should be recycled, but the lids should be removed. Aluminum and steel cans are the most recycled item. Even empty aerosol cans can be recycled with the plastic tips removed. Plastic containers coated one through seven are also recyclable. These include plastic soda bottles, juice, milk, soap bleach, and shampoo bottles with the caps removed. Margarine and sour cream tubs, yogurt cups, plastic deli containers, prescription bottles, and CD cases also can be recycled. Some items don't belong in your recycling bin. These include plastic bags, styrofoam, bottle caps, six-pack rings, food residue, wax paper, aluminum foil, light bulbs, and dishes. Household hazardous waste also requires special treatment. Household hazardous waste is typically gasoline, used motor oil, paint, paint thinners, and chemicals. Those items should not be put in your garbage or your recycle bin. We ask that residents can bring it here to the West Volusia Transfer Station or to the Tomoka Landfill, and we will dispose of it properly or recycle it and if you need to know what items can be recycled, you can visit volusia.org slash recycled. Do you love horses, think trees are cool, or support the armed forces? Well, if so, you can tell the world with your license plate. These are some of the 120 organizations and causes commemorated by Florida's specialty license plate program. For an extra $20 to $30 a plate, you can choose from a growing number of license plate designs and the additional fee will support your organization. Florida's newest plates promote Florida Freemasons and Lawrence Kids, a nonprofit organization that attempts to prevent sexual abuse through awareness and education. The most popular specialty plate continues to be the University of Florida, followed by Florida State University, sea turtles, wild dolphins, and panthers. Florida's specialty plate program began in 1987. The first tag commemorated the tragic Space Shuttle Challenger explosion. Since then, the program has raised more than $550 million for worthy causes and more than a million Floridians participate in the program every year. The Helping Sea Turtles Survive plate raised more than $1.4 million for sea turtle research and protection in 2012. One of the most successful plates promotes the arts. During the first six months of 2014, the State of the Arts tag generated more than $5,000 in Volusia County. The cultural arts tag is unique in that for every $20 of that tag comes directly back to Volusia County. 
And with that money that we receive, we partner with a lot of different organizations around the county. For example, the Museum of Arts and Sciences, we're a partner with them and their guild to sponsor their educational tent at their Halifax Art Festival every year. How can you get a specialty tag? When you renew your registration at a tag and title office, simply let the clerk know you want to replace your current license plate with a specialty plate. If it's not time to replace your license plate, you can pay a few additional dollars to switch to a specialty plate. The fee for a specialty plate is $20 to $30 above the standard fee, depending on which tag you choose. All the specialty plates are displayed in the county's tag and title offices. The demand for a commercial air service continues to be strong at Daytona Beach International Airport with another monthly increase in passenger traffic. Passenger traffic at Daytona Beach International Airport increased 5% in June compared with June of 2013. During June, 56,007 passengers flew in or out of the county-operated airport compared with 53,572 passengers recorded last June. And for the 12 months ending June 30th, passenger traffic at Daytona Beach International Airport increased 5% from 591,906 passengers to 623,007 passengers. Steve Cook, the airport's business development director, said the traffic increase in June is the result of additional seats offered by Delta Airlines and U.S. Airways, combined with increased service demand by passengers. The month of June, we went up 5% here at the airport, and uh, that, that was very good for us because we have had, actually had, out of the last 56 months, starting November 2009, we've had 51 months of increase. So it's been a pattern. Uh, we, we had a couple of down months in the winter time, but that was because of the cancellations up north. So the trend has been up. Our load factors increased uh, this year, this June, from 88% last June to 91% this June. So we're seeing more demand here at Daytona Beach International Airport. And we think that trend is going to continue for the balance of this year. Cook also said the month-over-month -month increase in passenger traffic helps the airport make a case for additional air service by new or existing carriers. I was just up in Canada and I spoke with six di different airlines uh, looking at Daytona Beach and I was encouraged by what I heard. I think as these airlines see our traffic increasing and having increased as a pattern, as a trend, I think that encourages them to consider Daytona Beach uh, for service. So I, I was encouraged. We're going to keep that process going. Uh, the thing that helps us the most is if our traffic continues to grow, which I think it will. For more information about DBIA or to book your flight, you can visit flydaytonafirst.com. This is sea turtle nesting season. Sea turtles typically use the beach at night, so never shine lights on sea turtles' nests, hatchlings, or adult turtles. Ensure lights are not visible from the beach. While enjoying your night walk, use a red LED bulb or a red filtered light. Bright artificial lights can deter turtles from nesting or lead them away from the water. The beach belongs to everyone, including our sea turtles. Thank you for making it a safer place for everyone to enjoy. Midsummer is a great time to remind families who are cooling off at pools and water parks that part of having fun in and around the water means taking vital safety steps to ensure that children and family members are safe and do not drown. Stephanie Strong has more about summer safety in this segment of Community Health Matters. There's no shortage of water in Florida, and where there's water, you'll find activities and fun. There are also important precautions that must be taken to keep children safe around water. This summer safety news conference put the spotlight on keeping children safe. Fortunately in Florida, we have a lot of opportunities to enjoy the outdoors, enjoy recreational water use from our ponds and lakes, oceans, rivers, and pools. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, in Florida, we lead the nation in the number of drowning deaths in children between the ages of one and four. We have enough drownings in Florida of those children 
to fill three or four preschool classrooms. Pool safety and heat sun related illnesses are very critical in the Sunshine State. They really hit home in our great city of Daytona Beach. We have a lot of experience in unfortunately dealing with the tragedies that fall with childhood drownings. The Department of Health's Waterproof Florida Drowning Prevention Campaign offers three layers of protection to keep children safe around pools. It really stresses barriers of protection for children, not only supervision by parents, grandparents, and caregivers, but also barriers around pools, as well as emergency preparedness, such as CPR, uh, as well as swimming lessons. Layer one, supervision. Supervision, the first and most crucial layer of protection, means someone is always actively watching when a child is in the pool. When children drown, they don't call for help. They don't scream, they just sink. And in seconds, in minutes, the children can die. Layer two, barriers. A child should never be able to enter the pool area unaccompanied by a guardian. Barriers physically block a child from the pool. Layer three, emergency preparedness. The moment a child stops breathing, there is a small precious window of time in which resuscitation may occur, but only if someone knows what to do. CPR is critical in the protection of not only cardiac related diseases as we're aware of, but also drowning. Uh, drowning requires a timely response from a certified CPR person. Even if you're not a parent, it's important to learn CPR. The techniques are easy to learn and can mean the difference between life and death. In an emergency, it is critical to have a phone nearby and immediately call 911. For more information about Waterproof Florida, please visit www.waterproofl.com. And remember, pool safety is everyone's responsibility. For Volusia Magazine, I'm Stephanie Strong, Public Information Officer for the Florida Department of Health in Volusia County. If you have any questions about this or any other health-related issues, you can always log on to volusiahealth.com. This week in our nine principles of Florida-friendly landscaping, Joe Sewards, our resident horticulture specialist, gives us an inside look at the importance of mulching and recycling yard clippings. This helps reduce the use of chemical fertilization. Hi, this is Joe Sewards and welcome to Horticulture Today. In our ongoing series about Florida friendly landscaping, today we're going to talk about two different principles. We're going to talk about mulching and recycling. Mulches have several beneficial roles in the landscape. As I say, they preserve moisture, they help reduce weeds, they help prevent weed seed germination as well as keeping weeds down on their own. As mulches decompose, they also add beneficial organic matter to the soil, and that can, over time, reduce the amount of money you have to spend on fertilizers. There are several different mulches available. Right now, you're looking at Melaleuca mulch. This is a very good mulch to use because you're helping to reduce a terrible invasive species in South Florida. Melaleuca mulch is heat treated, so there's no seed germination and it is one of the more durable mulches in the landscape. It has one of the lower decomposition rates of any mulches. In Florida friendly landscaping, we don't recommend the use of cypress mulch because cypress trees are disappearing faster than we're allowing them to grow back. Pine bark, pine straw, eucalyptus mulch, melaleuca are all renewable sources of mulch. Cypress mulch is not a renewable resource. So we advocate the use of renewable type mulches. Another good source of mulch is your own landscape. As you prune plants, as you remove trees, simply recycle the clippings into your beds. You can use utility mulch. Tree companies are very happy to provide you with a free source of mulch. The University of Florida recommends two to three inches of mulch maintained in your beds at all times. 
you could simply apply two inches of a utility mulch and cover it up with an inch of something that might be more attractive to you. That's going to save you a lot of money. It's going to accomplish the same thing of helping to reduce weeds. It's going to provide organic matter to your beds and be an overall huge benefit to your landscape. We do recommend that you keep mulches 6 to 12 inches away from the foundation of your house. This will keep termites away from your house as well. Termites do eat mulches, but there is no evidence to suggest that they make nests in mulches. Let's talk about recycling. Simply return grass clippings. That is of benefit to the lawn because grass clippings contain nitrogen, and by recycling grass clippings, you can reduce the amount of fertilizer that you need to apply to your landscape. Recycling is easy. By using sustainable sources of mulch, that is also a form of recycling. So, we covered two principles today, mulching and recycling. They're both easy, they're both of great benefit to your landscape, and they're part of any Florida-friendly yard. If you need more information on mulching, recycling, or any of the other nine principles of Florida-friendly landscaping, you can contact us here at the Volusia County Extension Office. For Horticulture Today, I'm Joe Sewards. Feel free to call us at the University of Florida Volusia County Extension Office, or you can visit our website as well. The phone number is area code 386-822-5778, or you can go to volusia.org extension. Well, let's head into the studio to join our very own Community Information Director Dave Byron with his guest, Coastal Division Director Joe Nolan, for this insightful discussion about the Artificial Reef Program off of Ponce Inlet. Well, thanks, Amber, and hi, everyone. You know, sport and commercial fishing is a major component of Volusia's recreational and economic makeup. And as such, the Volusia County Council has made a major commitment to the continued growth of the county's offshore artificial reef program. Today we'll get an update on the reef program. With us in the studio is our Coastal Division Director, Joe Nolan, who's been instrumental in the development of the artificial reef program off Ponce Inlet. Joe, how you doing today? Real good, Dave, good to be here. It was about a year ago uh, that we last talked about the reef program. Uh, we, we said that the county council with the county manager's leadership uh, really was going to go at this in a big way, uh, try, try to double, if not more so, uh, the, the number of reefs. Uh, so where are we now? Well, last year, uh, summer of 2013, we achieved the council's uh, 210 goal of doubling the number of artificial reefs located offshore mm -hmm. Volusia County. Right. We've now got 114 artificial reef sites, uh, individual reef uh, locations spread over 13 federally permitted uh, reef construction areas on the seafloor, anywhere from five to 15 miles offshore Ponce de Leon Inlet. Before we uh, talk uh, in detail about the reefs and why, why they're such a good thing, Joe, I, I wanna ask you about fishing in general, uh, ocean fishing uh, off the Volusia coast. Uh, you know, the last interview we had, we were talking about this red snapper ban and talking about uh, the general state of fishing in, uh, in, in the waters off Volusia County. What is the state of fishing today? Well, the fishing's great offshore Volusia County and inshore as well. We're a waterway county and uh, on the, in the coastal zone, the Halifax and Indian River are just bountiful uh, fishing locations as well as the uh, near shore and offshore waters, mm -hmm. uh, the natural and artificial reefs uh, offshore Ponce de Leon Inlet. We have all kinds of fish, you know, pelagic fishes such as cobia, kingfish, barracuda, sharks, uh, amberjack, and other types of migratory uh, fish that exploit the water column or spend time in the water column. Right. And then we have a, a tremendous amount of bottom fish, snapper, grouper, black sea bass, flounder, the type of animals that live and dwell among the reef sites uh, offshore on the near, near the bottom of the sea. So, uh, we've got great fishing. Recent uh, fishing news is all about black drum and redfish and right. flounder in the river. Right. Uh, and then, of course, the red snapper uh, uh, has been allowed to be, uh, uh, anglers can catch uh, recreational uh, limits of red snapper. I think it's one per person per day for three weekends this summer. So, uh, and we had a banner weekend. I think it was just this past weekend was red snapper weekend, the first uh, opening uh, this year and uh, had a tremendous catches of, of red snapper up to 20, 30 pounds. 
For those people that don't know what an artificial reef is, um, you know, give us kind of a layman's description. Well, we... Uh, it's pretty uh, simple to describe. It, it is. It's, it's not uh, rocket science per se, uh, but we get uh, large quantities of donated uh, concrete culvert uh, and structures from local concrete culvert manufacturers and regional manufacturers from Lake right. County and, and Central Florida uh, donated to the county of Volusia. Uh, to haul offshore for artificial reefs. And we uh, compile this material or, or stage it and store it at a, a riverside uh, staging yard in New Smyrna Beach with a relationship between the county and the city of New Smyrna uh, that has riverside access right uh, along the intercoastal waterway just inside Ponce de Leon Inlet. It's a, very, it's a great location, strategic uh, location for, for this type of uh, use. It's where the new public boat ramp is, as a matter of fact, right. uh -huh. in, in New Smyrna Beach off US-1 across from the airport. Uh, and we store and stage material there throughout the year. Again, this is donated material. We'll pay some trucking for, for right. it to be trucked to us, and we'll offload it. Our road and bridge division from the County Public Works Department helps us out uh, tremendously in handling the material and offloading it from trucks. And then we have a marine contractor that comes in it every summer and loads about 350 to 400 tons of, again, large uh, concrete uh, culvert pipe anywhere from seven to eight feet in diameter and 15 to 20 feet in length in some cases. Uh, we have to cut some of it, it's so large. Along with utility poles and jersey barriers and other used concrete materials. They're clean, right. no asphaltic material. There's no, uh, the the uh, uh, concrete is safe to discard in this way uh, and creates a great uh, uh, surface for, for marine growth. And we load about three, 350 to 400 tons on a large barge and our marine contractor hauls it offshore to one of our reef construction areas, double anchors it bow to stern uh, ex on exact numbers and GPS coordinates that we identify and where we want it placed. Uh, and then they simply push it off the side of the barge with a front end loader. Uh, so it's a fairly simple process, but it piles up on the bottom about the, uh, and, and builds a reef site about the size of a, a typical 2,500 square foot residential home. Uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 feet off the seafloor and a couple hundred feet in, in, in all directions in a big uh, Volusia County patch reef is what we call right. that. And that uh, just uh, immediately becomes colonized by uh, all kinds of fish, shrimp and crabs and bait fish start to gather around it. Uh, and it becomes fouled with marine biofouling type benthic invertebrate type organisms, bryozoan, barnacles, uh, sh uh, all kinds of attached shells uh, and tunicate and, and uh, uh, sponges and soft and hard corals. Mm -hmm. And uh, that material creates like a living, uh, a living uh, base of the, of the marine food web, right? Uh, and it's simply encrusting these, these concrete culverts. And then on up the food chain, other animals come in to exploit that living material that's growing right. on this reef site, right? So it's a, a it's pretty simple uh, process for us to do, and then Mother Nature takes care of the rest. And it's a, it's it's like a massive recycling program because well, and, and what's what's amazing, Joe, and I've seen some of the the underwater pictures that you have and so forth. And I know you're a diver, so you've actually seen it almost firsthand. But what's amazing is within a matter of days, this colonization or whatever you call it. Um, starts. It's amazing. Yeah, it really is. These are these, and and that speaks to a little bit about the the, the uh, nearshore continental shelf offshore northeast Florida. It's basically a desert, if you will. There's very little ar uh, natural reef ledge uh, that uh, animals can attract, can be attracted to and exploit and, and use as habitat. Right. Right. Uh, so once we place this on the seafloor, it's a it's uh, immediately an unusual anomaly, right, or an un unusual ledge location, and it instantly creates a ledge that, that animals will be attracted to. So, uh, like you said, in, in just a couple of days, bait fish are all gathered around this, and then, of course, there's pre large predators that are attracted to the bait right. fish. And then the, the biofouling uh, benthic marine organisms that uh, mostly invertebrate organisms that attach to the concrete uh, uh, create this growth and, and all kinds of uh, fish, shrimp, and crabs are attracted to it right. for habitat and for grazing and food and so forth and on up the line. And just in a couple of years, it, it actually within four to six months, we have red snapper and black sea bass. We've got, wow. uh, yeah, we've got photographic evidence of that quick uh, wow. uh, level of colonization of, of uh, commercially and recreationally important Finfish, so. All right, so I'm a fisherman or I'm a diver and I want to go fish by one of these reefs or I want to go dive by one of these reefs. 
How do I know how to get there? Well, go to volusia.org coastal right. division uh, website, and we've got a our GIS group, which is premier GIS or organization in the state, uh, has has created some interactive maps where you can actually click in and zoom right in on the reef locations. Uh, as I said, there's there's 13 uh, artificial reef construction areas and 114 different reefs you can you can find. And you can go to our website at volusiareefs.org and uh, or, or volusia.org coastal uh, artificial reefs and uh, zoom in on this interactive map and, and get the GPS coordinates for these locations and kind of see where they are in relation to all the other reef sites and then plan your trip. Are there any differences between these reefs? In other words, are they all pretty much the same in terms of, okay, I want to go to this reef, I want to go to that reef. Are they all pretty much the well, same? Well, for the, for the culvert structures, I think they are fairly uniform, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but we have a lot of steel ships that have been deposited out there, right. and they attract a whole different type of creatures. That's what I creatures. thought. Yeah. They attract a lot of uh, pelagic species that exploit the water column, right. like kingfish, cobia, uh, and amberjack, and almaco jack, and others, as well as snapper, grouper, and, right. and the groundfish, too. But they also attract large goliath grouper, which is these giant three to four hundred pound groupers that wow. live on these shipwrecks. And they're really the kings of the wreck. I mean, they're, they're incredible. And the shipwrecks make great dive locations, just terrific dive destinations. Wow. There's, there's a couple of local dive uh, charter operators that'll, that'll uh, take people offshore throughout the summer. Uh, and a lot of private divers here that have their own vessels that, that go to the shipwrecks as well. So they'll, they'll, uh, they'll attract a little bit different uh, set of organisms uh, and, and fishes from, from, uh, from the uh, culvert piles as well. But they're all good fishing and, uh, and great diving locations. Well, Joe, I want to thank you for sharing the information. This really is uh, one of the county's success stories. Uh, lots of fun uh, for everyone and really a very low cost, a very environmentally friendly uh, project. It's called the Artificial Reefs. Uh, the website, one more time. Uh, Volusia.org slash coastal artificial reefs link. Our guest today, Joe Nolan, he's the Coastal Division Director with Volusia County. And with that, we'll go back to you, Amber. Thanks, Dave, and thank you for watching Volusia Magazine. If you have any questions about the show, you can feel free to give us a call at any of the numbers you see listed here, or you can log on to volusia.org and click on the News tab at the top of the screen to find us. Incidentally, you can find the County Council's meeting calendar there, too. In fact, you can use volusia.org to find out about meeting dates, workshops, topics of interest, activities, and how you can become involved. And we hope you won't forget to listen to Volusia Today. That's Volusia County Government's weekly public radio broadcast. Volusia Today airs every Tuesday and Sunday mornings on the local radio stations you see on your screen. For Volusia Magazine, I'm Amber Patterson. Have a wonderful evening.